Welcome and thanks for being with us today. Uh, my name is John Bagnulo. I'm the Director of Nutrition for uh, Functional Formularies and I'm excited to discuss this afternoon the role of whole foods, particular foods, and you know, probably most importantly, uh, a diverse array of fermentable fiber in reversing uh, gut permeability which you know i think most of us understand at least on some level it's a major front for the immune system you know when you take into account the surface area of the digestive tract and how critical it is that we maintain um, a higher level of integrity between those epithelial cells this is a an absolute essential component of human physiology with respect to determining immune function um, and, and overall, the, the burden that can be placed on an individual or a patient's immune system. So with that being said, um, let's just review briefly here the importance of that, of that barrier. Um, you know, when we talk about these tight junctions, and, and that's in essence what we're, what we're discussing this afternoon um, with respect to increased permeability, which is when those tight junctions tend to separate. Um, often zonulin is responsible for that. Zonulin is a, uh, is a in, in, in essence, it's an enzyme protein secretion that is going to stimulate the breakdown of these tiny um, proteins that hold these tight junctions in, in closer proximity to one another. And, and zonulin is present in, in, in essence to provide the body with maybe short short limited windows of exposure to let's say a pathogen or a particular protein to familiarize the, the immune system with that pathogen or immune system allow the body to produce antibodies and to rally the appropriate defense uh, system for future exposures that's very different uh, however in contrast to what now tends to be a pattern of of increased intestinal permeability in many critically ill patients and those with even metabolic syndrome, chronic diseases, where there's just a high level of intestinal permeability all of the time. Um, and that's due to a variety of factors that we're going to discuss today. But this really, really turns the immune system uh, on its head. It can either drive a significant heightened immune response um, and over time can lead to autoimmune diseases. So that's, you know, that's in essence what we're talking about. This brush border uh, which lines the surface of the digestive system and is on the outer surface of these epithelial cells has to also be protected by a thick mucus layer, um, which is maintained by the presence of important commensal uh, families of bacteria uh, having the right food stuff, so to speak, to work on and, and to um, generate some of the substances need to, needed to maintain that mucosal layer. So that's the second part of this discussion. Now, this is a great paper. So this is a 2020 paper, um, Frontiers in Immunology, that I really enjoyed, and, I, and I'm sure you would as well. It looked at the role of stress in gut permeability issues, uh, both chronic and acute, and discussed a number of different uh, factors that would, in conjunction with stress, both physical as well as psychological stressors, would increase that permeability um, and what are the downstream effects of that you know and what's what's clear not only from this 2020 paper but from many others subsequent to that and we'll give you a really uh, an extensive reading list here at the conclusion of this talk today is that almost all of our autoimmune issues uh, that we see across broader populations you know those which are more common autoimmune issues they tend to have their origins within the microbiome and or the microbiome's influence on the gut wall and the level of permeability uh, that exists there. Higher levels of intestinal permeability have time and time again been associated with a greater and greater uh, risk for various autoimmune disorders. So again, this 2020 paper is a, is a must read, especially for those of you, you know, those clinicians which are in the fields of immunology, rheumatology, um, I think you're going to really enjoy these. So we know that the microbiome 
has a huge influence on both metabolism, metabolic patterns, as well as we've been talking about thus far on the immune system and its ability to respond appropriately, not an over response, not an under response, but the appropriate response. And you know, when you look at something like diabetes um, and, and understanding that we have probably three different types of diabetes, you know, two which are well understood, the third, which is the 1A, so to speak, which is where maybe the, you know, the pancreas has been, for whatever reason, damaged, the beta cells have been damaged to a point where there isn't enough insulin being produced. Um, to rally uh, and, and gain better glycemic control. But, you know, that aside, we know that with type 2 diabetes, there's an inflammatory component. Um, with type 1 diabetes, there's definitely an autoimmune-like uh, component to that. And in both of these very different types of diabetes, we have uh, the role of increased intestinal permeability front and center. We know, for instance, that with type 2 diabetes, uh, based on various, uh, you know, various studies, that it's clear with type 2 diabetes, there is usually a pattern of dysbiosis within the gut or microbiome, and families of bacteria are now associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, and there are others which we know have a protective effect, such as acromantia. But you know, either way, these lipopolysaccharides, which are abbreviated as LPS molecules, once those start to enter circulation, they will, and they are a definite result of this increased intestinal permeability. The slang term for that is leaky gut. Um, you know, sometimes that gets kicked around a little too loosely, and, and that's why it's, I, I think, has been looked at a little more cynically by many clinicians, you know, leaky gut, you know, what is that? Well, you know, the really the technical word for it is you look at the gap junctions, that the gap junctions are, or these tight junctions are too wide, and they're allowing too many substances, larger molecules into circulation, which really increases the burden on various organ systems. So whether we want to call this increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut, um, it's less important to me. I think what's most important is understanding the you know, the physiology behind either of those expressions. And then understanding that with increased intestinal permeability and dysbiosis, which often go hand in hand, these LPS molecules, these lipopolysaccharides are highly inflammatory to both the blood brain barrier, um, as well as to a variety of other tissues in the body, which play critical roles in health, such as uh, you know, artery linings, we know lipopolysaccharides are very inflammatory to components of our circulatory system. But when it comes to diabetes, those lipopolysaccharides, in essence, trigger the pancreas to, to produce or secrete even more insulin. So it becomes this vicious cycle where dysbiosis kind of stimulates excessive insulin production, and we end up with higher and higher levels of insulin resistance. And, and with type 1 diabetes, these lipopolysaccharides um, you know, may have some of this kind of autoimmune triggering effect, but it may not even require the lipopolysaccharides that there's enough mechanisms here with HLA, DQ, DQ um, you know, variety uh, of, of genes, you know, on that axis, so to speak, that are driving an autoreactive T cell type mechanism. So in either case, with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, um, intestinal permeability plays an enormous role. And, you know, this is a, you know, this is now over 12 years old. This is one of the first uh, kind of mainstream publications to discuss this. This was Scientific American. It was looked at um, as, you know, great summary of groundbreaking landmark papers from 2008 and 2009, which were showing a, a breakdown in the gut wall being caused by the absence of important families of bacteria, as well as potentially an overgrowth of potentially pathogenic bacteria, and then a variety of other substances, such as certain components within uh, dairy foods, which we'll look at in a little while. Um, obviously, gliadin, which is a type of gluten found in wheat, um, that's a well-known uh, cause or contributor to increased intestinal permeability. And in fact, for those individuals who are um, who, who are suffering from celiac disease, the zonulin expression, the zonulin secretion causes a breakdown 
uh, of these of these tight junctions that last for in some cases weeks or months with a, with a single exposure to gliadin. For the average person, you know everybody has a zonulin response to gliadin, even if uh, an individual is not celiac. For the for the average person, that the window of time with which these tight junctions are wider or are more permeable might be anywhere from four to eight hours after having exposure to dietary gluten, gliadin in particular, that's one we know, know the most about. But the, the point of this slide is really not to, um, you know, focus, you know, extensively on gliadin um, and, and the zonulin connection there, but to really reflect the broader picture here. This is a 30,000 foot level of everything that can go wrong with respect to these tight junctions given what we know about dysbiosis and a variety of dietary antigens or proteins. You know, zonulin is, is one of the, you know, I think in the last two decades in the area of gastroenterology, immunology, it's one of the bigger breakthroughs. Um, obviously, Alessio Fasani um, discovered zonulin and its relationship to, to wheat and gliadin and celiac disease. But, you know, we can really take that to just about every um, corner or area of medicine now and understand that this this gut wall, this breakdown in essence, which is often triggered by zonulin, um, it just has such an enormous control over an individual's immune function uh, for the remainder of their life. So that's why, you know, I'm sure we've all met, I certainly have in my practice, I've met patients who have experienced very unique uh, you know, changes in their immune function, in their digestive function, um, as a result of a particular illness, uh, course of treatment with antibiotics. In, in much of those changes that take place um, subsequent to those, to those medical events are really the changes that took place within their, within their microbiome and or their gut wall. And, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes, you know, people are first diagnosed with celiac disease when they're in their 50s or 60s. Um, you know, what are those events that take place prior to that, whether that be with the epithelial cell, that you know, those brush border we're dis discussing, um, but why is it that the heightened zonulin response to something like gliadin uh, occurs at such a exponentially higher rate at one point in life as opposed to earlier. These are some of the mysteries that still exist in, in terms of our understanding gut permeability issues, but um, it's really clear that whether we're talking about just general chronic inflammation, which we know can contribute to heart disease and you know just every chronic disease that has been um, studied to date, uh, or we're talking about autoimmunity or cancer, that this, this barrier uh, this front, as I like to describe it, which is, look, it's, it occupies three quarters of our immune system. And there, three quarters of the body's immune system lies within one to one and a half centimeters uh, of this gut wall. So that's why it is so relevant to every area of medicine. And we know that there are, in addition to gliadin and certain components in, in dairy foods, for instance, we know that there are a very large number and a, a long list of other foods and nutrients which have the ability to modulate uh, gut, the gut barrier. You know, for instance, alcohol is very, um, very well understood that it causes increased intestinal permeability. The only thing worse than alcohol on its own is when alcohol is combined with um, high levels of polyunsaturated fat and or fructose. Those appear to have, you know, an exponentially greater effect on increasing uh, gut wall or intestinal permeability. And then there are, you know, there are various aspects of, of foods that have the ability to decrease or really tighten up uh, the gut wall. For instance, whey protein, that's, you know, that contains immunoglobulins that have clearly been shown to improve, um, you know, gut permeability issues. And there are others as well, such as you know, curcumin, um, which is found in turmeric. Here's a, an abbreviated list of some of those and, and the models of, of how they've been examined, the references in parentheses. And it's, it's really fascinating. You know, we, we talk about the importance of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, and there's really mixed reviews on how those influence gut wall 
permeability issues. There are studies which show that, you know, using fish oil, and this is some of the work of individuals like Sanjay Ghosh, um, you know, where fish oil given in, you know, more pharmacological dose, we're not talking about eating fish, uh, whether it be canned or fresh, we're talking about taking fish oil, were very detrimental um, to gut permeability levels, where something like vitamin D, zinc, I mentioned curcumin, as well as um, epigallocatechin complexes, the EGCG, which is in green tea, um, camphorol, which is in coffee, those have all been shown to significantly reduce gut wall permeability. So, you know, again, uh, just such an incredible amount of interplay because of dietary components, the microbiome, and all the different families of bacteria that reside there. Um, but the connection becomes clearer as we look at, for instance, if you just take a look at respiratory diseases um, and you look at the importance of diverse and as well as ample amounts of commensal or beneficial families of bacteria, that's critical for having healthy lung function. As soon as this bacterial dysbiosis, an imbalance or overgrowth in potential pathogens, as that starts to develop, again, um, most of this has to do with the immune response there at that front, you start to very rapidly see changes in lung function, asthma, COPD, cystic fibrosis, these, these conditions are almost always accompanied by some level of dysbiosis. And we know that immune function and lung function often go hand in hand. So with dysbiosis, this is one of the first steps in understanding a breakdown in these tight junctions. With dysbiosis, uh, whether that dysbiosis is characterized by a deficiency in beneficial bacteria or an overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, it leads to at least an initial, the initial stages of tight junction or gap junction breakdown. And these are some families of bacteria, which you know, we've discussed in the past um, in, in these types of webinars, you know, that are associated with this is these are patterns of dysbiosis that are observed in the microbiomes of obese patients and individuals, which are often very much representative of those uh, observed with higher levels of intestinal permeability. What we know, you know, clearly are that lower levels of, let's say, the actinobacteria tax, taxa, um, which is, you know, well represented by bifidobacter, as an example, that having lower levels of those is almost always associated with higher levels of gut permeability. And, you know, most of this has to do with the importance of certain families of bacteria in generating N-butyrate. N-butyrate is a four, it's a four carbon uh, short chain saturated fatty acid that is a primary requirement for the, the, the healthy um, intestinal wall lining that we're looking for. Those cells, those epithelial cells require N-butyrate to have the, the type of intestinal uh, wall integrity we're looking for, tighter tighter configuration. And you know, we, we have a variety of uh, studies now looking at dietary patterns, not just the fiber content. We know fiber is critical and that the fiber really needs to come as much as possible from whole foods, whole plants, as opposed to refined fiber types, which are often added to try to compensate for higher levels of sugar um, or to promote regularity, bowel movement regularity in patients. But you know, that really short changes uh, many of the values of fiber. So when we're discussing the importance of fiber in, in supporting a healthy microbiome, one that's diverse and is rich in N-butyrate producers, you know, what's, what's been shown is it's not only the fiber content, but it's also the protein content. Higher levels of dietary protein, which often, to be fair, are, are accompanied by lower levels of refined carbohydrates and lower levels of sugar were equally protective with respect to microbiome diversity um, and a greater representation of those microbial species which provide tighter um, intestinal 
lower levels of intestinal permeability. So both protein and fiber are associated, uh, higher levels of each is associated with the type of microbial diversity necessary for reduced levels of intestinal permeability. And this is N-butyrate, right? This is, this is really where it's at when it comes to one of the primary requirements for lower levels of, of gut permeability. This four carbon short chain fatty acid is produced by a handful of important families of bacteria, all of which need to be supported with fermentable fiber. Um, and that fermentable fiber may be something um, like a ligand. It may be something like a hemicellulose, which would be found in some of your the stalks of various vegetables, or it could be resistant starch. You know, resistant starch is a great food source uh, for many of the N-butyrate producers. And, you know, examples of those are fecal bacter Um, You know, again, fecal bacter prosnitsi, along with, as I mentioned, bifidobacter, um, you know, and there's a long list of others such as ruminococcus, rosburia. You know, these are all either primary or secondary and butyrate producers. And when you take a look at the microbiomes of healthy individuals with lower levels of intestinal permeability, um, you know, really very, very low levels of in inflammation um, in general, you know, these individuals almost always have higher levels of most, if not all of those end butyrate producers. So that's, that's a really important part of this discussion is feeding providing the necessary life rafts for these families of bacteria by eating foods that will contain um, molecules that in essence have to survive upper GI digestion and or absorption. You know, if a diet is made up of largely sugar uh, and those sugar molecules are being absorbed in the small intestine, not much survives that proximal um, transit time there in the digestive tract to the colon where, you know, that's where these, these important families of bacteria need to have food arriving on a, on a regular basis. And so that's why fiber is important as well as resistant starch, which can't be digested um, with normal amylase activity. It really requires microbial fermentation for it to be broken down. And then, you know, when we get into so as we step aside here for a moment from the microbial role in gut permeability, and we start to look at other aspects of the diet, you know, we've talked about gliadin, um, but one lesser, I guess, understood, less familiar component would be A1 casein, which is found in many dairy products. You know, A2 casein or A2 beta casein is found in the milk of goats, sheep, um, in, in certain kind of older breed, I, I'd say some of your English or, or yeah, your Channel Island um, breeds of cows, those, those bovine species would produce A2 casein, which does not have this uh, BCM7 or beta casomorphin 7. That is a very interesting molecule when it comes to gut permeability, because unlike the whey protein that I mentioned earlier, which appears to be very protective and can reverse gut permeability issues. A1 casein has the exact opposite effect. In fact, when you look at the effects of um, A1 versus A2 beta casein on intestinal myeloperoxidase and interleukin-4 levels, both of which are going to reflect inflammation, um, zonulin, gut permeability, you can see that the A2 uh, phenotype of milk really results in lower levels, control equivalent levels of this intestinal myeloperoxidase. So there's going to be no changes, no increase in gut permeability. Whereas as you move towards an A1, A1 phenotype um, within an animal's milk, you start to have a really significant jump in gut wall permeability. And as you can see with interleukin-4, a very significant jump in inflammation um, there as well. So, you know, it's just, it's remarkable how you can have within, let's just say dairy foods, you can have something like goat, um, 
sheep's milk products, you know, whether that be yogurt, cheese, or the milk, and then you can go into something like a Guernsey cow. And these are all going to be predominantly A2, A2. But once you get into the milk of a, of a Holstein cow, for instance, which is, you know, generally A1, A1, and that's unfortunately 95% of the U.S. dairy herd, you know, you end up with a very different response there at the gut wall. So again, we've got the role of something like gliadin. We've got the role of a A1 beta casein protein in influencing the tight junctions uh, in the in increase in intestinal permeability, as well as a, a more general pattern of dysbiosis. I mentioned fructose. You know, when you take a look at the role of fructose in driving uh, inflammation, increased gut permeability, dysbiosis, it's really clear. Fructose favors the growth of pathogenic strains of bacteria, which tend to really increase or raise the level of gut permeability. We know that because when fructose is administered in animal studies with an antibiotic, the antibiotic blunts the, the effects that fructose has on the gut wall. So the fructose uh, connection to increased gut or intestinal wall permeability is really microbially dependent. Microbes in the, mi in the gut, in the microbiome, respond in a way to higher levels of dietary fructose that increases intestinal permeability, as well as, you know, there's a significant burden placed on the liver, higher levels of inflammation, that we understand, but fructose as well um, is detrimental to gut, gut permeability. And then I mentioned polyunsaturated fats, you know, especially the omega-6 rich seed oils, industrial seed oils. When you look at the role of saturated fat, uh, as well as you can see here with the dark bar graph, saturated fat and ethanol alcohol, you know, very similar levels. You, you still have um, in, in general, you don't have the, the effect that you get once you get down to your unsaturated fatty acids. And then when you have unsaturated fatty acids with ethanol, that really blunts um, clodden production. So there, thereby you have much, much higher levels, much higher levels of, um, gut wall permeability, meaning that the highly unsaturated or polyunsaturated seed oils are detrimental, but when combined with alcohol, um, you know, it gets, it gets much worse. So if you want to read more about the role of those, this is a 2012 paper in a journal that is, you know, really focused on um, alcohol, alcoholism and uh, patients who have suffered from alcohol abuse and their physiology has suffered. It, it's well known that saturated fats are much more conducive um, to the recovering alcoholic, both to their liver as well as to their, their gut wall and microbiome, than a diet that contains larger amounts of polyunsaturated fat. And much of this has to do with the, the high omega-6 content. And a lot of this also has to do with the ability of excessive amounts of highly polyunsaturated fats to the lipid raft, which really controls everything that enters a cell. And, you know, much like we've been discussing with increased intestinal permeability, and that being an issue, we know that on a cellular level, higher, higher levels of these omega-6 uh, seed oils tends to disrupt the lipid raft model, and it makes a cell membrane much more susceptible to oxidative stress, inflammation, and it makes the overall cell membrane excessively permeable as well. So, you know, it's really interesting. We can, we can go micro to macro with so many of these topics. We can, we can really look at the brush border. We can look at intestinal permeability. We can really focus in on that. But when you, when you really get down to it, the effects that our diet and, and various aspects of our diet have on our cells is often reflected in every organ system. So this is just further, you know, a further illustration of where that lipid raft can change significantly with the addition of, let's say, fish oil here in this, in this model. So higher levels of fructose, higher levels of omega-6 rich seed oils, and even your very long chain, highly, unpol highly polyunsaturated oils, such as you know, DHA and EPA found in fish oil, you know, larger amounts of those can really alter prostaglandin levels. And so now we've got a few other facets that are contributing to a breakdown um, in these tight junctions. 
And then we can get into other aspects such as glyphosate exposure, which we know um, is at unprecedented levels. You know, there's various organa organizations now who have either tested, um, you know, very, very widely consumed food commodities um, that have been tainted with glyphosate. You know, we've, now we have research looking at blood levels and urine levels of Americans. And we know that, you know, many of us have high levels of glyphosate exposure. And we know that glyphosate has um, very immediate and dramatic effects on the microbiome. Bifidobacter, for instance, which I mentioned earlier as being a primary and butyrate producer, which is needed, um, you know, really to have a, a good gut wall, a good level of gut um, integrity, so to speak, and less permeability. That is one of the uh, first families of bacteria that is going to be influenced by glyphosate exposure. So, you know, there's different layers to this. Um, we know that our mitochondria are also going to, to suffer with higher levels of intestinal permeability, higher levels of dietary fructose, the glyphosate. So it becomes really the perfect storm, which the breakdown uh, of tight junctions is front and center. Now, what's the solution, really? I mean, I think that's what's always important uh, to have in a discussion like this. You know, it's, I think it's easy to focus on everything that's going wrong. Um, maybe not easy, but it, it's something that, you know, most people have at least some level of awareness. But really, the, the, the important question is, how do we resolve this? How do we start to improve the higher and higher levels of gut permeability that patients are suffering from? Well, it really starts with what the Sonnenbergs, um, you know, now developed the term for over, over a decade ago, which are these microbe accessible carbohydrates, MACs. There just aren't enough of these in the average American's diet. The diet is too refined. It doesn't matter what population you're looking at. You could be looking in the area of, you know, pediatrics. Kids don't have enough uh, solid, less digestible food in their diet. Everything's ultra refined. Everything's consumed in liquid form for the most part. You can look at in an elderly population. You can look at an increased reliance on foods, which are, again, easy to swallow. They're being, you know, more in liquid form. People are drinking more of their calories than ever before. And if you're going to drink your calories and it's not a smoothie you're making at home, um, you know, with the right ingredients and you're buying something off the shelf that, you know, is ultra refined, you're using an enteral formula for the critically ill that's ultra refined, there won't be these MACs present. You know, they're only going to be present in whole foods. And I think that's one of the most important take home messages. If you're trying to improve uh, gut permeability issues. You're trying to reduce a patient's risk for things like sepsis and bile acid uh, mediated inflammation. You've got to have whole foods because with whole foods will come the microbes that you need to maintain a healthy gut barrier. And it's, you know, it's, it's probably the most fundamental component to resolving this issue. And we know that across the board, MACs, you know, these, these carbohydrates that are really only accessible to microbes and not to our digestive enzymes, we're not going to absorb any sugar from them. We're not going to be able to break glucose off of them very effectively. They're going to survive our efforts to digest them, whether it be through chewing, salivary amylase, the pancreatic enzymes, they're going to survive all of that. And they're going to, going to get into the colon and into the microbiome where important families of bacteria are going to get a swing at them to grow their populations and to produce substances which are anti-inflammatory. So that's number one. Number two, and it's equally you know, important, it's tied into this, is fermentable fiber. You know, when you eat whole vegetables, when you eat legumes, which have been, you know, again, soaked and thoroughly cooked. So we're not talking about, you know, creating digestive distress. We're talking, talking about legumes, which have been, you know, through whether it be through proper cooking techniques or food processing, have been made more digestible, but not completely digestible, we're ending up with the kind of fermentable fiber. And, and it, equally important to this is, you know, again, avoiding the ultra refined foods, those which have really high carbohydrate densities, you wanna avoid those in favor of lower carbohydrate dense foods, those with carbohydrate densities less than 23%. And then all the phytonutrients, that come in whole foods, you know, in whole vegetables and in berries and your brightly colored fruits and, you know, as well as in things like, you know, for that matter, you know, 
non-filtered coffee and turmeric. You have all these polyphenols, which we know also have a very important role in improving gut permeability issues, resolving that, uh, you know, in a very supplemental um, fashion, you know, meaning that you're not going to rely on unfiltered coffee or turmeric on its own to improve uh, an excessive level of gut permeability. But when you put those types of foods and the nutrients found in those on top of a whole foods uh, fermentable fiber rich diet, they're often a very, very helpful in, in taking a, a patient to a much better place when it comes to their immune function as a result of reducing intestinal permeability. This shows the array of fiber. When we talk about fermentable fibers and we talk about the various types of fibers that are found in whole vegetables and in legumes and in things like berries, you know, in the orange here, you see the amazing array of, of fiber types that are out there. Then you can see all the different physiological effects that they have. And it goes way beyond regularity. So you've got this functional component um, in a nutrient fiber that so many people underestimate the value of. You know, if you look at fiber as being something that only provides regularity, you're really missing the mark in terms of its, its value. I, I would argue that fiber is every bit as essential as protein, your essential fatty acids, the carbohydrate content of a diet. You know, we're so overly focused on those nutrients which provide calories, but they're of no use if the microbiome is in a state of disarray. It doesn't matter what micro or macronutrients you're providing. And really the only way you maintain a healthy microbiome is by having an array of fiber, which historically has not been looked at as an essential nutrient. This illustrates, you know, again, uh, Erica and Justin Sonnenberg's uh, landmark paper on MACs. It's, uh, if you haven't seen this, um, you know, I, I highly recommend it in cell metabolism. It's a great paper, but it just really shows the importance of these short chain fatty acids and how they are going to be a function of microbes as well as these MACs. So I just included this um, because I, I thought many of you would find that interesting. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I have a long list of papers that really reflect the importance of either particular nutrients that you include, those that you might need to avoid or really reduce in terms of a patient's diet, um, and overall, you know, the role that this intestinal permeability plays in patient health. So I think you'll find these papers as well as some of the others that are referenced earlier um, in this discussion. I think you'll find them really interesting. And so with that, um, I'd, I'd like to answer any questions that I could. Thank you, John. That was a great review. Um, there are plenty of questions rolling in, so um, I will just go ahead and dive in. So um, is ghee or butter a good way to get butyrate? Yeah, and butyrate is, is usually found at a level between three and 4% of butter by weight. That's actually a very significant amount. You're not gonna find it um, you know, at that level really in any other food. So it is, butter is a, I think butter is a, is a viable way to get some and butyrate, but you really can't rely on and butyrate um, from dietary sources alone. It's one of those nutrients, uh, you know, especially when we're talking about short chain fatty acids, that you have to try, a patient has to try to produce endogenously. So while I really do value the contributions of butter, not only for ambutyrate, but obviously for other, you know, other great nutrients as well, um, you know, I think butter can supplement our ambutyrate requirements. But I think the, the long-term, more effective, sustainable solution is to have the right families of bacteria present in a patient's microbiome and to make sure that they have adequate amounts of you know, resistant starch and, and various types of fermentable fiber. If you ferment um, A1 casein milk, does that change the protein enough that it wouldn't cause permeability or it would cause uh, less gut issues? Well, yeah, I think it would cause less gut issues. There will be some breakdown, some um, breakdown of this A1 beta casein 
with fermentation, but you won't get complete breakdown. Unfortunately, you know, the, with most fermentation processes, it's subtle um, and the casein tends to form a curd in the case of cheese and, and, and some other fermented dairy products. So you don't really break it down enough, but it would, it would improve it at least some. Um, and also, you know, fermentation in general is going to produce some metabolites. I like to describe them as there's some beneficial substances that will, you know, potentially compensate a little for um, the presence of A1 beta casein. That's why I always have a hard time answering the question, you know, is it, is it good to avoid A1 casein completely, even if it means you might eliminate, you know, yogurt in a patient's diet? And I, I generally say no. I think yogurt is one of the most protective foods studied to date. I mean, there isn't a, there isn't a vegetable, for instance, or a fruit um, that could replicate the protective effect of yogurt when eaten on a regular basis. You know, a lot of people here eat more fruits and vegetables, and I obviously think that's important. I would like to rephrase that as eat more vegetables and fruits. Um, that being said, you know, yogurt is very unique in its um, the risk reduction associated with its daily consumption. That has, you know, that has a lot to do with the microbes that we're, you know, offering an individual daily with that kind of regular consumption. Um, but I, you know, again, yes, fermentation will clean up a small amount of the A1 beta casein, but it won't eliminate it completely. Questions on fructose. Is there an upper threshold or a max amount? And can you clarify the difference? There's a few questions on this between um, fructose from whole fruit and types that are um, isolated out. Yeah, surprisingly, there, there is a paper looking at apple juice and apple consumption. They found very similar, the researchers found very similar effects on uric acid levels, which often reflects the amount of fructose in a person's diet. Um, you know, small, dense LDLs, triglycerides, you know, area under the curve. So I, with fructose, I would say, you know, surprisingly, you can get excessive amounts of fructose from eating you know, probably larger than ideal amounts of fruit. You know, I don't have a, you know, an exact amount of fruit per se, but I know, for instance, that Robert Lustig, um, you know, at University of California, San Francisco has suggested 10 grams of fructose per meal as an upper ceiling, 25 grams of fructose per day as an upper ceiling, meaning that when you exceed those kind of levels, you create a burden. Uh, typically, you know, his research has looked at the liver, um, when it comes to the microbiome, I would argue that obviously whole fruit is going to be better for the microbiome than a refined uh, source of fructose because the fiber, it might be, it may be minimal with fruit doesn't contain typically the kind of fiber that vegetables do. Um, but I would argue that at least you'd have some fiber coming in with a whole fruit that could blunt some of the damaging effects of that fructose. But on the broader topic of fructose consumption, there is a misconception that we can eat as much fruit as we want without there being, you know, any deleterious effects. And that's just not the case. You can, you can easily consume too much fructose from even whole fruits, especially those which are really, you know, significant sources of fructose, like such as mangoes, you know, apples, pears, even bananas, grapes. Those are the ones that contain the most fructose, whereas you have fruit choices with almost no fructose, like tangerines, um, citrus in general is very low in fructose, and berries, blackberries, cranberries, raspberries, um, to a lesser extent, blueberries, and these are all really low in fructose. So, you know, those are the kind of fruits we can eat more freely without having to worry about the, fruc the fructose level, so to speak. That's great. Um, and then there's a lot of questions on omega-3 supplements and fish oils with regard to uh, gut permeability. So can you clarify yeah more about supplementation um, and including how they're often recommended as an anti-inflammatory approach. Yeah, you know, I think there is this um, assumption and it's a, look, it's an assumption I was under in my early, earlier part of my career, which was that fish oil was only beneficial, right? That it was a source of anti-inflammatory fatty acids that would you know, ultimately favor, you know, series one or three icosanoids and all was well. We know now that's just not the case. We know that all of the research on fish oil um, at best is inconclusive, 
but with fish consumption, it tends to be very protective, meaning that, you know, people who eat fish two to three times a week, they tend to have a lower all-cause mortality, not just with respect to heart disease, but, you know, lower incidence of cancer. Um, really just seems to be very protective uh, overall. That is more fish consumption. When you look at the use of fish oil, you really don't get any of the benefits um, that you'd assume or that are associated with fish consumption. And so, Again, you know, researchers have tried to get to the bottom of this in different ways. You know, they've looked at, for instance, what are the effects on hemodynamics? You know, is one of the reasons that fish oil, you know, isn't as protective as eating fish is does a flood of DHA and EPA into the into the bloodstream? Does that change our hemodynamics? And does that, you know, maybe alter normal or optimal circulation? And it's always been thought that it just thins our blood. You know, maybe there's there's more to it than that. You know, we really don't have the time to dive into some of these potential mechanisms, but Sanjay Ghosh, who I consider to be, you know, just a, an overall top researcher, has shown that there is a pattern of dysbiosis with regular fish oil consumption. There are definitely, uh, it's been established now, there are detrimental changes to the, um, to the gut wall, the barrier, higher levels of intestinal permeability. And so at the end of the day, you know, fish oil is not fish. Um, you're only getting DHA or EPA in most of your fish oils. And I think that really is such a reductionistic approach to the variety of longer chain, polyunsaturated, and to some extent, saturated fatty acids that you're missing when you're just using an oil and you're not eating the fish. I mean, there's heptadecanoic acid. That's a 17 carbon saturated fat that's found in many species of fish. And it's, it's been associated, again, from taking biopsy samples from elderly folks, you know, those who have the higher levels of this C17 um, in their tissues, they tend to live longer and have very low risks of heart disease um, and chronic disease in general. And one of the only ways you're gonna get this uh, 17 carbon saturated fat is by eating oily fish, but it's not found in fish oil. So, you know, I think it really begs to the question, you know, there's limitations when we try to make any whole food into something that's less than whole. And we're always trying to make a drug or a medication out of a food, right? I mean, we, we, take, we take the extracts from, from various plants, which we know are protective, and then we, we try to make a drug out of them. They just don't work the same as when we eat the whole food. And I think that's the same thing that is being, you know, slowly here, the, the picture is starting to, to come into into resolution, you know, we're starting to see that eating fish is protective, but taking fish oil doesn't carry the kind of value that people have assumed it does uh, you know, for the last three or four decades. That was a great thorough answer. Um, the next big one is on the topic of seed oils. So I'm gonna group a couple together, but your opinion of seed oils if consumed only in the whole seed form um, what type of oils do you recommend and how does canola oil fit into that equation? Yeah, one of the, there's a few things we need to, I think, pull apart here. And I, I think your question really speaks to that, Catherine, which is number one, when you eat a whole seed or a nut, you are obviously getting much more than just the oil. And there are often fibers, um, you know, found in a nut or seed, which will have very unique effects on the microbes present that ultimately have to work on bile acid. Now, I didn't, in this conversation this afternoon, I didn't get into the role of bile acid um, as much as maybe I could have. It's a little technical. Um, bile acid, which everybody understands is needed to emulsify dietary fat, right? To so make it less hydrophobic so that we can, you know, if in essence, break it down into smaller molecules and, and absorb it. Well, when bile gets into the microbiome, different families of bacteria have very different effects on bile. And we know that most often the commensal or beneficial species of bacteria very often convert bile to something known as lithocholic acid. Lithocholic acid is a bile acid metabolite, which will reduce gut wall permeability. You know, so that's why it's, I, you know, again, it's, it's an important part of this conversation, um, but it, it, it is a kind of a longer discussion looking at how various components alter bile, um, the fate of bile acid in, in the microbiome. Nuts and seeds 
tend to favor the conversion of bile to lithocholic acid, especially ground flaxseed, really well established that ground flaxseed has ligands in it. And these ligands are very unique in favoring um, or, you know, really helping with a favorable bile acid metabolism by gut microbes. So that's very different. You know, flax oil is very dominant in its omega-3 content. So it's great in that aspect. It's, it's you know, it's not like a fish oil that's a long, um, highly unsaturated omega-3. It's a precursor to those. The body will only convert the omega-3 uh, omega threes from flax oil that it needs to DHA or EPA. So you kind of have a built-in check and balance system with that. Um, but when you get into refined seed oils, like a sunflower oil, a safflower oil, canola oil, soybean oil, you know, all of these are what we refer to as your seed oils. They're highly polyunsaturated. They're refined to the extent where they're not accompanied by polyphenols, like, like is the case with olive oil. You know, olive oil is anti-inflammatory, not because of its monounsaturated content, because it contains polyphenols, you know, squalene, all these other substances, but that's because it's extra virgin olive oil. So it's only been mechanically pressed. Your industrial seed oils like canola, soybean, these are not simply mechanically pressed. You know, these have a level of refinement that strips away polyphenols, phytonutrients, ligands, and all of the things that work synergistically towards a favorable metabolism or a favorable influence on the microbiome. So that's why I'm in favor of people eating nuts and seeds, but I'm not in favor of people using the refined uh, industrial seed oils. So I, I know that was a very long-winded answer. I apologize. No, there was a lot to cover in that. So thank you. Um, and then next big one is on the topic of gliadin. So can you speak again to how it impacts permeability and does it impact everyone, even if they're not, uh, they don't feel that they're gluten intolerant? Yes, absolutely. Gliadin across the board, across all humans, it has an influence on zonulin secretion. So with exposure to gliadin, zonulin will be released or secreted and it will cause a breakdown of the tiny protein filaments that hold these gap junctions together. In a non-celiac individual, that increased intestinal permeability as a function of gliadin exposure will last anywhere from four to eight hours. In a celiac patient, it can last weeks. That's the difference. It's the severity of that uh, zonulin secretion and the way that the human immune system will interpret gliadin. But it is not good for any individual's intestinal permeability. Um, even if someone is asymptomatic, uh, gliadin in particular, that's considered the worst of all gluten types, um, it is going to result in increased intestinal permeability. It's really interesting when you hear the story about how zonulin was first discovered. Um, you know, Alessio Fasano was working on a cholera vaccine, an oral cholera vaccine that should not have been absorbed intact. Um, he noticed that many of the individuals that they were um, trying the vaccine out on were getting very sick and he couldn't understand how the oral um, vaccine in essence was ending up in circulation and it was because it was in those individuals who were consuming the uh, the oral cholera vaccine in the presence of wheat that the increased intestinal permeability was allowing them to absorb this um, cholera vaccine intact rather than having it stay in the in the digestive tract so really fascinating background to that and can you share some sources of resistant starch in the diet? Yeah, one of the easiest ones for uh, people to, I guess, envision or maybe have access to, there's two. One is a green banana. Um, green bananas, which are really starchy. They don't have much sweetness, very rich in resistant starch. Another one would be uh, white basmati rice that's been allowed to cool to roughly room temperature. Um, another one would be buckwheat groats. Um, buckwheat isn't really a grain. It's not a member of the wheat family. Um, it's a very unique plant uh, in, in terms of botany. It's known as a dicot. It's, anyways, buckwheat is a good source of resistant starch as well. Um, potatoes, white potatoes, for instance, sweet potatoes, which have been allowed to cool as well. Once, once the cooling process takes place, the starch will retrograde into what we call resistant starch, and then it 
it will survive the upper um, human GI efforts to digest it or break it down. It will survive into the, into the microbiome. So those are four or five really reliable sources, potato starch or a potato that's been boiled and allowed to cool to room temperature. Same with a sweet potato, uh, white basmati rice could have 40 to 50% of its um, glucose will be tied up as resistant starch, meaning that we won't be able to absorb it. Um, it won't affect our blood sugar levels. That, that's if it's been, you know, again, allowed to cool to room temperature. Green bananas, um, buckwheat, those are all good sources. Okay, and then some more specific food questions. So your thoughts on kefir, kombucha, um, and I'm going to throw in um, coffee. What's the best type of coffee to do? Um, so yeah, kefir, kombucha, and coffee. Your thoughts on those? Yeah, that those are easy. I really like kefir. I think it's a great um, source of beneficial microbes. I think whether it's kefir or yogurt, they should be found unsweetened without a thick, uh, you know, fruit puree, sweetened puree at the bottom. You really just want to get whole, um, unsweetened yogurt or kefir. I think they're great. Um, I don't think as favorably of kombucha. I don't think that kombucha is always a bad per se, but I think there are um, versions of kombucha out there that do very little for a person's microbiome um, and tend to have a higher level of, of sugar or sweetness than would be optimal. But I, I would never put kombucha in the same sentence as yogurt or kefir, which are very complex and do wonders for the microbiome. And then with respect to coffee, you know, I look at, you know, unfiltered coffee. So like, you know, making coffee with a French press, let's say, or using a percolator and, and then, you know, decantering that off to leave most of the sediment behind. I look at those as being the, really the healthiest ways to, to consume coffee. And I think, you know, your, really your coffee beans should be a light or a medium roast, not the really excessive, uh, excessive dark, you know, high temperature roast. But I, you know, I think a light to medium roast coffee that um, is let to sit for around five to eight minutes in a French press, I look at that as being maybe the gold standard for, for coffee when it comes to things like camphorol, carweol, um, and some of those really beneficial polyphenols that we know feed families of bacteria like Ackermansia and, you know, in terms of today's discussion, have been shown to decrease intestinal permeability. And what about um, non-dairy sources of yogurt or, or um, kefir? What do you think about those? Yeah, I think they have the potential to be really helpful um, with respect to the microbiome. I know that there's some unsweetened coconut milk yogurts out there. There are cashew milk yogurts. I, I think almond milk yogurts. You know, you have a lot of different non-dairy um, milk yogurts that are out there. I think it's just really important that... Um, you know, that consumers read the ingredient list on those and just make sure that they contain, you know, some diverse um, beneficial probiotics. You know, I, it's important that you see, for instance, uh, bifidobacter. Whenever you, whenever you can find a, a kefir or a yogurt or one of these non-dairy yogurts that contains bifidobacter, it's going to be beneficial. You know, I think having bifidobacter and, you know, a couple other strains of beneficial bacteria in there is important and making sure that they're not um, sweetened to try to, you know, create the flavor that is more naturally occurring in, in like a, a traditional milk yogurt. All right. And since we're close on time, this will be the last question, but um, any thoughts on testing or, you know, how to guide someone if they think they have intestinal or permeability, are there any reliable sources that you turn to? Well, historically, it's a great question, by the way, great question to end on, you know, that, that there's a variety of different ways that intestinal permeability can be assessed. One major area that doesn't really require uh, extensive testing may just require an interview with a patient, you know, tending to look at, you know, kind of their, their history. It's the development of multiple food allergies that seem to have a, like a chronological basis, right? So maybe an individual starts out with a, a shellfish allergy, or they start out with a peanut allergy, or, and then, you know, over the course of five to 10 years, they have, you know, seven or eight different allergies. That's really common. That speaks to 
increased intestinal permeability. More and more of these antigens are being allowed intact into circulation, and over time, the immune system, you know, starts to recognize all of these as an issue. So that's a very um, kind of, I'd say, user-friendly, non-test require, uh, required way to assess this. And you can go from that place all the way to doing like a mannitol recovery test, which is, you know, mannitol is a, it's a sugar alcohol that, you know, should not be absorbed across the brush border. So it shouldn't end up in our urine. Anything that ends up in our urine had to get absorbed. I think everybody understands that. And if you give someone a mannitol recovery test and there is mannitol in their urine um, post-administration, that means that, you know, this larger molecule was, you know, being delivered to circulation across the, across the gut wall. So that's what's usually been used um, kind of in the functional medicine area here over the last 20 years or so. And that, that's a, you know, it's a very unique test you have to request. Not all physicians will offer this, but most folks, you know, have one sense or another that something's going on. Like if you've got a, you know, a really heightened immune response, you know, I, I would say in the case of autoimmunity, I think, it's, you know, really anybody with autoimmunity should have this, the potential role of heightened gut permeability explored. I just think it's, it's such a common and integral component to those diseases. Um, but I, you know, I think you can go with the presence of multiple food allergies. You can look at the presence of um, something like rosacea when someone's under stress. You know, that often happens when someone's under high level, higher levels of physical or psychological stress that they'll have these, you know, these outbreaks or th these symptoms that would really speak to the breakdown of the gut wall. So that's, yeah, I think that's probably the best way I can summarize that. All right. Well, thank you so much. We are at time. So just a couple of announcements that um, the slides will not be shared for those asking, but I will send a list of the references out later today. And for dietitians, the credit is pending from CDR. So once we have that, we will send that out or um, inform you otherwise. Um, and thank you so much, John. It was a really great presentation. So I will let you wrap this up. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Appreciate it. And thank you everyone for, you know, for being with us today. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to share this kind of information with you. Take care and be well.